All right, how's it going? You got Josh Sucher here from Train Heroic. I'm here with Kier Wenham Flat, and I'm excited to chat with Kier about how Kier's leveraged things like Train Heroic to, to build a business, and importantly, how he helps coaches that are either in the online space, in the team space, um, in a brick and mortar, build their business. Um, so Kier, welcome, and I'm excited to chat with you. I'm doubly excited after that pronunciation, man. You nailed it. <laughs> So here, give us a little bit before we jump in, um, you know, people might know you through your work with Strength Coach Network, with Rugby Strength Coach. Can you give a little background kind of on your journey and how you've gotten to, to where you are today? Well, I'll give you the, the condensed version. So I was, uh, would have loved to have been a professional athlete when I was a kid and I got to 15 and realized, you know, I'm five foot 10, not very athletic, not very brave, not very skillful, none of that. And uh, I kind of got the message by the time I got to my late teens and with a brief foray into being a psychologist because I thought that was more intellectually respectable. I kind of thought, right, no, I want to do sport. What's the closest I can get to that environment without being a player? And I decided, right, you know, I like the academics. I like to train. I'm going to go uh, be a strength coach within professional rugby. And after my degree, horrified to learn, wasn't actually a coach. I was a researcher. So I had to wander in the wilderness for two years to, to get my reps and actually learn how to apply the, the craft kind of thing. And in 2010, I started in professional rugby and I stayed in the UK for the next three years. I moved to Australia, got very, very lucky and my career went like this. And I started to work with Argentina, the, the national uh, rugby team over there. And after a few years of that, a fourth place finish at the World Cup, went to Japan, did another rugby team. And midway through that, I thought, right, you know, what do I do now? I'm going to work in the NFL. So I started again in, in college at University of Richmond in 2018 and uh, immediately had an unplanned baby. So <laughs> I did that until 2020. And since then, I've been full time uh, in the online space, uh, helping coaches, helping rugby players um, and looking after my son. Beautiful. Beautiful. So what's been the biggest learning for you in going from the physical space to, to the online space? I think there's a lot of principles that align. Um, and actually, I think it's one of those things where if I reflect back, being a, a business owner or being a self-employed person has made me a better coach and vice versa. So you know when you're a coach that you have to look for that limiting factor within the system. You have to be methodical. You have to have a, you know, a, a laid out approach that you're going to implement. You have to have metrics that you're going to use. And those things all apply to, to business. I think the, the kind of nuts and bolts of how it gets implemented, some of it is, is more intuitive. Um, some of it is less so. You know, if I reflect back on my own time, I think sales, I just tell people when it gets to sales, just think of a toddler, you know, but why, but why, but why, you know, nagging people, persuading, all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, humans are instinct, they're instinctively good salespeople. They just kind of forget how to do it. But then there is some stuff when it comes to uh, the online space in particular that has to be learned. I think copywriting, which is essentially salesmanship in print and how to write and how to get a message across and, and be persuasive. That's definitely a, a learning curve. I think likewise with uh, branding and, and content and all of that kind of internet specific stuff. Uh, again, there are some people that are naturals at it and there's some people that struggle with it, but there's definitely success leaves clues and you can kind of reverse engineer what does work and, and plug your ideas into that. Yeah. Beautiful. So tell, tell me about that journey in, into business. Like how has that gone for you? It sounds like you had a lot of success in the rugby world. Um, even in, in the you know college football world, how, how is, how have you taken what you've learned there, applied it to the online world? And what is that? What has that kind of amounted to for you so far? So, I mean, the cliche is that um, necessity is the mother of invention. And for me, it was poverty. So all I did once I started this unpaid internship in 2010, no money coming in, but I'd been working as a personal trainer, training people in you know, physical spaces. And they just expressed an interest in continuing to work with me. And that's effectively, I fell into to working online and it was very, very uh, crude. It was literally PayPal, email, social media, organic traffic, you know, no, no deliberate marketing, nothing really like basically relying on, on word of mouth. Yeah. And the, 
example I use to, to tell people about the value of niching and specializing in a population and solving problems is, I think it's still on Facebook. Until 2013, I, my brand was my name. It was Training by Kier. And if you had a pulse and you had money, I would train you. And in four years of beg, borrow, steal, ask people to follow the Facebook page, not even to buy, 750 likes. But, you know, I think I was kind of getting the hint after several years of my career in rugby started to take off. I only write about rugby. I only talk about it. I only play it. I only train rugby players, really. I'm getting more and more credibility in rugby. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should just specialize in rugby. You know, I don't look like a cover model. Should I really be telling people how to gain 20 pounds of muscle and get shredded and all that kind of stuff? So I came back from my first stint in Argentina and I bought the domain Rugby Strength Coach and hired a graphic designer. I thought, right, okay, whilst that's going on, I'm going to start the Facebook page. Not a perfect metric to infer business success. There's a lot more that goes into it than just getting clicks, but it did 1,500 in a day. So I, I made double the amount of progress that I'd made in the previous four years by niching down and specializing in a, a particular population. And I think the same is true of, of Strength Coach Network as well. Um, I started Rugby Strength Coach because what I wanted when I was a player didn't really exist at that time. So I was like, right, okay, I'm going to go out and build what I wish I had at that time to make it easier for people and maybe people will buy. And then if I look at um, Strength Coach Network, it was exactly the same. I mentioned to you that two-year period in the wilderness. Why is it that I paid all that money for a degree and spent all that time and I still wasn't even qualified to work for free? And the answer to that was, you know, real world, applicable knowledge, a good network, and being strategic about how I approach my career. So that, again, was what we went out and, um, and built. And, you know, to be completely honest with the, the numbers, like that's definitely been the biggest moneymaker um, of my career. And by the time I sold up, I think it grossed like 1.2 million uh, in the last three years since I went full time. So, yeah, pretty, pretty, you know, not, not earth shattering, but pretty decent, you know, certainly yeah. enough to leave coaching and, and look after my family and, and pay three staff. And yeah. Yeah. Congrats, man. That's a, that's amazing. As somebody that's uh, been part of building something from, from the ground up, it's never yeah. linear. There's a lot of, a lot of learning along the way. So congratulations and just being able to, to accelerate that. You said something that, that I, that resonated with me and I see it all the time. So like my role at Train Heroics to work with kind of our star coaches, yeah. um, people that uh, we believe or they believe can make a living and a very good one selling training online. They typically have like big social media followings or a big channel one way or another, um, are respected, put out awesome educational content. And there's typically an opportunity if they've not seized it yet for them to make quite a bit of money scaling their training. They might be selling training programs or memberships to training. And um, to, to um, kind of get at, at my point here is many of them make the mistake of being for everybody and they'll put out a product that is yeah. for any, everybody. And, and the, what always kind of rings in my ear is if you're for everybody, you're not for anybody. And you mentioned, Hey, in, in a kind of like a, I don't know, a weird way when I niched down, then I finally grew. Yeah. Can you kind of talk through why that, why that is and why focusing on yeah. a little niche and, and in your, in your world, you focus on something as small as just, just rugby and why that, why that actually yields real growth. Well, I think the easiest way to do it is you, you have to put yourself in the shoes of that population. So all consumers are, are most likely to buy when they feel like there is a solution that is tailor-made to their situation, their constraints, and the problem that they are uh, facing right now. And the money goes to the person that they perceive has the highest likelihood of success at solving their problem quickly and easily and at a fair price. So if I'm a rugby player, I will, and I'm, you know, how do I become a better rugby player? How do I get faster on the rugby field, more, more explosive, stronger? I'm naturally going to gravitate to a rugby strength coach, for example, that works at the international level and has 20 testimonials from players that probably play at a higher level than me and have, have what I aspire to. Conversely, if there's this guy called Training by Kier, who he has one rugby player and 19 other testimonials that might be just as impressive, but from different backgrounds, different problems, it doesn't convey as strong a signal to the buyer that I am who I say I am and I'm going to solve your problem uh, at a fair price. But another reason that you want to, to niche is actually a couple. One is, he's very popular right now, Alex Hormozzi, he talks about the value equation. Value is the likelihood of a dream outcome 
multiplied by, um, sorry, the magnitude of the dream outcome multiplied by the likelihood of success divided by uh, how long it's going to take and how difficult it's going to be. When you choose to specialize in solving one problem, you get better and better at solving that problem. So the classic example that I always use is any rugby player comes into me, I probably know already they train on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they play on Saturdays. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are going to be the high days. Monday's a low day, Wednesday's off, Friday's the captain run, Sunday's off. I've already got that in my head and I'm ready to go and start solving their problem. But I remember the first time that somebody showed me a pitcher rotation in uh, collegiate baseball and I was like, right, how do I figure this out? And you know, time is money. I'm, I'm solving that problem on a lower level, slower than a baseball specialist. You can guess where the money's going to go. And I think the final reason that it pays to niche is that because we have this negativity bias as human beings, we're always more motivated to get out of pain and to solve problems than we are to seek pleasure. So we need to be able to, as coaches, speak to people's problems. So we need to understand them and their problems. We need to be able to speak the right language. We need to know where to meet people where they are and speak to them and, and demonstrate trust, likability, and authority in solving those problems. And baseball players hang out in certain places, rugby players in another place, football players in another place, people who want to drop 20 pounds of fat in another place. And if you're trying to be all things to all men, you're not going to be able to, to steal an analogy, you don't become heavyweight champion of the world by throwing one massive haymaker. You have to like hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them. And that's the same in your communication with people trying to turn them into customers. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Definitely some, some, some nuggets in there, even just this sentiment about, you know, how willing people are to do the work to get out of pain and speaking yeah. to their pain is something that, that resonates. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. So, you know, it's, what's has struck me even just in the 10 minutes that we've been chatting here is you've been a coach your whole life. Um, at least at the point that you just in your professional life at the point you decided, Hey, I'm going to be a coach. And initially it was in the rugby space and in the football space. And, and now you're, you're doing some coaching that, um, I think many of our, well, you're doing some coaching for coaches yeah. and, and, and this is something that is, um, I see it firsthand. I see it all the time. It's something that we need desperately in the industry. I think the nature of coaching is that we oftentimes get into this because we love it. Uh, we're, we're servants just by nature and yeah. it's hard to sustain a career in coaching. And you see a lot of turnover, uh, for that reason, not because people don't love the profession or love the endeavor or find fulfillment in it. But at the end of the day, you have to do something that's sustainable for, you know, wherever you are in your journey. Sometimes that means supporting not just yourself, but a family. So can you kind of talk through uh, the value that you're looking to bring to the world in coaching coaches and, and how that's going so far? And then we can get into some of the specifics. Yeah, too. well, the, the kind of light bulb went off in my head when I was running uh, Strength Coach Network. So we would always interview on the front end. Like we would, we would send out an email, hey, what can we do for you today that's going to solve your problems? And we would interview them when they, they canceled. It's just the nature of subscription businesses that you have churn. Right. And we would ask them like, what is it that we could have done better that you want to achieve? And there is, there is value for sure in you know, a faster 40, a higher the, you know, that, that technical knowledge that makes you a better coach in terms of the X's and the O's. But the number one concern or the, number, the, the top two concerns would be, I want to make more money and I want to have a higher status job. Now, the education can drive the higher status job. If you are a more knowledgeable coach, you're going to bump your chances of um, getting a, a higher status job. However, there's a few factors at play. One is the, the cronyism or, or nepotism within the field. Unfortunately, there's a lot of coaches out there that have advanced their careers more by being liked by the right people uh, rather than more knowledgeable. Now, with those higher status jobs comes more money. So that's absolutely a pathway to, to more money, but it's, it's hard to, to force that. Sure. So with that said, how do we make more money? Well, unfortunately, if you work within the team environment, the amount of money that you make is, like I said, related to your job. And the thing that drives your job is nothing really that's technical. And often it's how long you've been in a job that determines how much money you make. It's very, very rare if you're the number four and number one retires, that you just go straight to number one. Two will go to one, three will go to two, and everyone kind of bumps up like that. So the ability to drive that increase in income isn't really uh, within your hands a lot of the time. But if we take the mentality that 
the the skill set that you have, the experience that you have, the knowledge that you have, and for most people, just a general familiarity with something like social media, that can be deployed tomorrow to drive an increase um, in income. And for me, the decision to kind of change tack a little bit was, it was multifactorial, but I kind of got burnt out with the, the detail of strength and conditioning. Um, it had been a few years since I had left full-time coaching. I thought, well, you know, really, do I have that much, you know, credibility skin in the game in that environment anymore? And then also I have to be honest about where my interests lie. I got a stack like this of training books uh, on my table that hadn't been read. And then I'm constantly consuming the business stuff and, and working on the actual, the system that was Strength Coach Network. So having considered all that, that was behind the decision to sell to Justin Lima. I think he's super well qualified to drive the site forward and uh, the site's in good hands. But if I reflect on, you know, how is it that I can best serve strength coaches now, now that I have that, you know, built and sold strength coach network under my belt and it aligns with what I'm really putting my energy into right now. And I think that is a really big help to strength coaches. I'm not saying that I'm going to make you a millionaire, but I think for most strength coaches, you know, making one, two, three, four, five thousand dollars a year extra on the side. That makes a big difference when you make, you know, 30 grand, 40 grand. And the great thing about it is as you get better and as you iterate and as you double down on what's working, that number is in your control to drive up. And the big benefit to that is you can do what you want to do just for the love of the game because you have that secondary source of income to kind of uh, as a buffer against that. If they do fire you, you know, it's less of a sting. I call it uh, escape velocity. When if, you, if your monthly income uh, is covered by a secondary source of income, you could get fired from your main job tomorrow and you could survive indefinitely. You're not going to start looking for any job that you can take. And that third thing of basically being able to, to take more control of your, your work environment, your work decisions. So when you know that you, don't, you can't afford to bite the hand that feeds, Typically, the, the guy that gives you your job and says, hey, we're going to do this in training, you feel a lot more pressure implicitly to you know, play along. Yes, I'm going to do this. And I think being able to take back some financial control increases your ability to do what you feel is right in a work environment rather than just because you have to do something. Basic. So talk me through some of the, like, talk me through some of the, the tactics there. So you you get into the online space right now you're serving uh initially you're serving athletes and you're just doing it online um yeah. at least prim, you know that that's a, a lever that you're using to to pull the to get growth and now you're coaching coaches and so can you kind of walk me through some of the tactics and i know Kier, you you offer a course and we'll get into how people can take advantage yeah. of of that course but what are like maybe just some high level bullet points of that i should know as a new coach getting into the online space, if just even some of this message resonates, hey, I want to take more control. I want some escape velocity. I want to have just uh, some security and importantly, maybe even more impact than I can have inside the, the, the walls of, of this gym. So I would say to steal from Peter Thiel, who's about the, the first outside money in Facebook, he said the function of all businesses is to create value for their customers and your reward as a result of that is to capture value. So value is whatever people are willing to give up to get something. Yep. They're typically giving up money. And value is, because of the negativity bias that we talked about, it's the removal of pain or the solution of problems. And what creates that value? Probably you know, three or four things. Health, you don't die. Turns out healthcare is quite a lucrative industry. <laughs> money. Financial services and all that kind of stuff is a, another massive industry. And normally like status, relationships, or feeling. For anything that's not money, it is the dollar value that we ascribe to the feeling or the result that we get. How much is it worth to, to not be in, you know, have back pain? How much is it worth that the feeling that a Gucci handbag gives you? How much is it worth the status of being able to bench 315 gives you, for example? So by definition, the more painful the problem that we pick and the more effectively we solve that problem, the higher the dollar value that people ascribe to it and the more they'll give up to get it. So you want to pick big, painful problems that you have the power to solve. 
but you also need to make sure that you're picking people that have the ability to pay and it's a significant population that's underserved so they might want bottles of ice cold water in somalia and they you know they'd say yeah i'm gonna give i would happily give you a thousand bucks for that bottle of water but if the money's not there it's very very hard to do business so it's much easier to sail with the wind and pick a population that has uh, deeper pockets more desire to spend to solve their problems and maybe is a little bit more underserved so yeah. the rule of thumb i tell uh, sport coaches if they have the ability to pick is to look at the advertisers on the media for that sport so if, for example if you look at the ufc it's like bud light protein packs all that kind of stuff not saying that they're terrible products but they're not expensive brands whatsoever and most people that i know that even work in the ufc they struggle to make money because fighters don't have a lot of money if you look at motorsport golf tennis polo it's cartier don perignon you know all these like high level financial brands and stuff that that is big money brands that sponsor those sports because they know the people that watch and participate in those sports can afford expensive stuff so the average country club member who plays tennis has a lot more money than the average mma enthusiast so if i have the choice between those two i'm probably going to gravitate towards um solving those problems and then you already alluded to it which is getting traction or or owning a segment is really what it's all about you want to be the 800 pound gorilla in the room where nobody is going to mess with you because in anything in business once people start to realize hey you know josh josh is getting some traction he's getting some success he's making money they're going to come in and try and take your lunch it's just the nature of business sure you need to be so well positioned that they would be dumb to try and compete with you. It's just, it's just pointless. So this ties into the book, Blue Ocean Strategy. You want to go to where the ocean is blue, not where the sharks are like fighting in the ocean is, is red. So you want to niche down and just be an 800 pound gorilla where you own that segment. And ironically, you do it by targeting a more and more and more narrow audience so that you just own that area. And it's kind of like trying to start a fire with a magnifying glass. If the focus is too broad, if you're always moving around, you never catch fire. You have to drill right down, tiny focus and hold. And that's where, for my own case, looking at rugby strength coach, that's clearly the difference that it made for me, even though it was a you know, not very sophisticated approach. Yeah. Beautiful. So pick big, painful problems. Yeah. You have to pick problems that people are willing to pay for. Right. Yeah. So this concept of like sail, sail with the wind and then own a segment. So yeah. get traction in a, in a segment that's niched down. Can you walk through what that might look like for a coach? So sure, you know, hey, I want to get into uh, the rugby space. In fact, I just want to train forward or something like that, right? Yeah. Like how do you, what are some tactics to, that coaches should start to implore to do that, to own a segment, to start speaking we to just it? just touched on forwards. Were you talking about Luke Lewis? <laughs> exactly. He's, exactly. Yeah, he's, he's very smart. So as you were saying it, the example that popped into my head is if you look at specialists, even in the football world, it's not like, oh, I'm a football guy. You have quarterback coaches, O-line coaches, wide receiver coaches, corner coaches. Because even within the football world, the, the language used, the problems faced, the result that people want varies. And it still pays to specialize um, within that. I think what you have to do when you pick a niche, as we already alluded, or you know, Alex Hormozzi would say, growing. So supply and demand. If there is oversupply relative to demand or demand is growing more slowly, there is downward pressure in terms of what people will pay for this. Case in point, strength coaches. You know, there's a lot more people joining that conveyor belt uh, every year than there are uh, jobs being created. Conversely, if the demand is growing faster than the supply, there is upward pressure. People bid up the price. You, you're going to be able to charge more without even being that much better at what you do. It's just the nature of the market. So you have that painful problems, which we alluded to, the ability to uh, spend money, and also the ability to, to reach people directly. So I think, just as an, an aside, whenever you try and do business with uh, teams or youth athletes, it adds a layer of complexity because you actually have to sell twice. You have to sell once to the kid, once to the parent. You have to sell once to the coach, once to the guy holding the purse strings. A little bit yep. more complex, but I think the more directly that you can reach people and persuade them that you have a solution to their problems, you're off to the races. When it comes to picking a niche, underserved, 
it's much better to uh, be shooting a, a goal that's not being defended than it is uh, that has a defender. I think anything where you have a track record is good because all customers are always running this calculation in their heads. Is this guy who he says he is? Can sure. he deliver the result that he's talking about with a high degree of likelihood? Am I risking my money? Am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my energy? And the more credibility you have, the more those social cues suggest that to people and the more ease they are, the more likely they are to buy. Another thing is what you like to do, what you're good at, because business is hard. You want to pick something that you're enthusiastic about. Sure. And then I think another thing to think about is if there's some alignment between uh, the way that you like to communicate and the platforms that you use to communicate and where your intended audience hangs out. If you know, for example, that you're going to target 16-year-old basketball players, they're probably going to hang out on TikTok. If you're 15 years old and you're still figuring out what, uh, 50 years old and you're just figuring out what Facebook is, you're going to struggle. <laughs> so that's, that's another thing that you need to think about. Awesome. Yeah, I had a coach in college, uh, this guy, Jim Harbaugh, that ended up you know, coaching at Stanford in the Michigan and, or in the Niners in the Michigan. And he, we had a reunion. And at the reunion, he said, hey, I've got one piece of advice for you guys as you're getting into the business world. Pick something. It doesn't matter what it is, but it needs to be something that you absolutely love. Yeah. If you have that passion, um, you'll figure out how to make money and you'll figure out how to beat everybody in your field because you because you love it. And I had never heard that before. But even just this sentiment of, sure, the niche might be there. They might be willing to pay. It might be underserved. If you don't love it, uh, then it probably doesn't make make that much sense because things will get hard. Uh, and you've just kind of always got to you know, put in the hours and, and do the work to, yeah. to stay ahead of the game there. Here, you had, you had mentioned this term credibility, right? That people are making this kind of calculation in their own mind of, you know, can this person help solve my problem? Yeah. Um, how have you been able to establish that credibility and maybe even like what recommendations or suge suggestions do you have to coaches to, you know, once they've identified what they want to serve, who they want to serve, how they're going to serve them, how yeah. to make sure that they're increasing that credibility and that trust? Well, you know, the, the kind of the coaching cliche of the, the biggest predictor of future injury is previous injury. The biggest predictor of future success is previous success. So the more examples that you can hold up to someone and say, here's somebody who's just like you, had the same problem as you, wanted the same result as you, and here's what they achieved. That's kind of like, uh, it's almost like a court case. The more pieces of evidence the stronger the case you make, the more you persuade the jury. So if I show you one of those people, you'll be like, eh. If I show you two, three, yeah. four, the, the upper limit of testimonials does not exist. So if you go on uh, callmecare.com slash money moves, there's a section of testimonials where it's a slideshow and it's just, I think it's 20 plus slides. Because every time you add another happy customer, it's, you're strengthening that perception. If you're starting out and you don't necessarily have that body of work, that list of customers that you've done business with, there are still social cues that we can uh, draw from to not create the illusion of authority. Like some of them are actual authority. And if you read the book Influence by Robert Cialdini, things like being featured in the media, uh, memberships of associations, teams that you've worked with. Uh, your own achievements. It helps if you have embodied the solution or the experience of the problem that you are selling to people. Vernon Griffith said to me one time, is very smart. He said, every time you do business with somebody, you are selling them the aspiration or the hope that they can achieve what you have achieved. They have to want to be you or what you have a little bit to buy from you. Um, and, you know, it's funny that Social media is awash with this and pe people use it in a manipulative manner, but follow accounts. Who's this person followed by? Who are they pictured with? What does their content look like? Who shared their stuff? All this kind of stuff. These are rightly or wrongly cue, uh, psychological cues that we use to uh, implicitly evaluate is, if someone's credible or not. Not all of them are accurate, but we still factor them in. Awesome. Awesome. Sure. You mentioned money moves. Um, and this is, I think, you know, something that you kind of looped me into a little while back and it's something that I'd like to touch on a bit. So you offer a course, 
called yeah. Money Moves. Can you tell us a little bit about the course, specifically the benefits of signing up for the course, what it might look like, and importantly, like what somebody might uh, turn into on the other end of it? So Money Moves has been around for like almost a year. And the reason that I, you know, I reached out to you all those months ago and we've, we've kind of established uh, this dialogue is that I think a mistake that I made, you know, it's another thing from business. You always ask for feedback, like what was good, what was bad, what do you want to change? Yeah. And I almost put too much pressure on myself uh, in the first two iterations of the course because I said, you know, here's, here's how we grossed over a million bucks. And I went out and dumped that into the course. And the feedback was from people that it's almost like drinking from a fire hose. So there was a lot of talk about, you know, I, I wouldn't con consider them sophisticated because we were doing them at the time, but to, to a novice, they might be sophisticated. So things like um, CRMs, customer relationship man management software, automated email follow-up, video sales letters, one-click upsells, order forms, <laughs> automatic pay uh, payment processing, tagging, you know, automations, staffing, technology, systems, these are first world problems I've learned that most coaches, if you, if you said to them, Hey, hit, you know, go out and do this, they're going to struggle to get to that. It's almost like analysis paralysis. So I refined, um, after the first one refined after the second one. And that was kind of when I reached out to you, when I realized actually, if we can just get down to pure brass tacks and say, what's going to, what's going to make a big difference to you in a short space of time. So the, the value proposition that we arrived at is $1,000 of income in eight weeks or less using nothing but Train Heroic and your own social media. Because those issues that I talked about by partnering with you guys have been completely, um, completely removed. You don't have to have a website. You don't have to pay for hosting. You don't have to worry about payment processing or automations or are people going to steal your IP, stuff like that. Most people have the necessary number of connections in my opinion to to make a thousand dollars in uh, eight weeks and there's no infrastructure that you need to do that you just need to look at what's inside the course uh, it's it's eight weekly modules there's a kind of theoretical uh lecture that lays out the the important concepts there is a walkthrough of the, the worksheet which is okay how do we apply those principles in the real world what does it look like for you and your business and I show myself going through those worksheets. But more importantly, we show within Train Heroic how that gets built, how it looks in the real world. So for example, how to create a program, how to write a persuasive sales letter, how to set up your, a, a basic sales funnel, how to track where your traffic's coming from. If you want to use ads, how to dip a toe with that and so on. And because of that, yeah, the, the guarantee is if you don't make a grand in eight weeks, I'll coach you for free until you do. Because going back to that risk thing, I want coaches to, to know that when they sign up for something like this, that they're not risking all that money because it's, it's tough to be a coach. I want to put them at ease that they're not going to make a net loss on that course and they can come into it confidently. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And that, and that Kira, that's, that's an eight-week course. You sign up, you can take it. Um, is it eight weeks because there's some interaction with, with you in between, or can you pace yourself? Can you go faster than that if you want? Right now it's live. I think it may go evergreen, but I think that eight weeks is, is kind of the sweet spot. I think if somebody just decided, right, I'm going to be an online coach. I'm going to work full time on this. No other distractions, probably a couple of weeks yeah. uh, to, to build it all out. Like um, using myself as the example, I, I, built and promoted a template on train heroic in jujitsu specifically because i have no professional accolades in jujitsu i have no personal accolades in jujitsu at the time i was a blue belt and I'm, I'm now a purple belt but you know certainly nothing to write home about in the sport and i also don't have a big social media following with regard to jujitsu uh, but using train heroic i was able to build it write the sales letter and break a thousand dollars of income in two weeks beginning to end so i think if you're really about it it can be done in a, in a couple of weeks if you have a full-time job if if you're new to it it takes a little bit of time to digest and to go away and work on the practical tasks so i think eight weeks is, is about the sweet spot yeah cool so just a little background i cure we set cure up with a with an account i gave you i don't even think we spent any one-on-one -on -one time training on how to use the platform and 
I think, you know, what you were hoping to get out of that is, Hey, I want to, I want to first do it myself to show people exactly how yeah. it's done. And so I always do this in, in working with the coach where I'll jump into their account, have access to the back end, and I go in and uh, I can't remember the exact amount that was on there, but I was like, Oh, wow, here's, here's crushing it. And so I was excited just to get some of the details of how the heck you were able to do that because we don't see that success happen as fast. And specifically, we don't, don't typically see it without any uh, support or intervention. Yeah. Um, and, and I think one thing that was really interesting is when we do find the coach that, you know, makes a thousand or 10,000 or even a hundred thousand uh, dollars on a monthly basis, that person typically has a huge social media following a big wait list of people that can no longer train with, you know, that they can't uh, offer one-on-one -on -one training to. So there's a lot of people kind of banging on their door for this. That mm -hmm. was not the case here. And even I love the fact that you took this approach of, Hey, I'm going to do something that I'm not super expert in uh, that people don't follow me for in, in jujitsu. Can you kind of talk about some of the tactics or is that reserved for, for the course? Ah, no, we can talk about, you know, obviously it's, it's the, I think the money and the values and the implementation and the kind of paint by numbers. Yeah. But basically try to apply the, the same principles that we've, that we've already uh, touched on. The same elements within a program presented differently create different results. So you could say for jujitsu, hey, this is going to add muscle to your frame. Do most people want to go up a weight class? Probably not. You know, most jujitsu athletes are trying to be lighter. Yeah. Uh, but the program that I wrote still has high rep stuff in there, maybe to increase a little bit of lean muscle mass and, and stuff like that. But if I put myself in the, the shoes of a, a jujitsu practitioner, which is easy to do, I had a knee surgery in January. I tore my other knee two weeks after coming back from the first one. I can't straighten either elbow. Uh, my neck hurts, my back hurts. It's probably going to be injury prevention and, and management of pain that's the, the primary um, problem being faced. I think the second is that there's not really a lifting culture in jujitsu. People don't know what they're doing, so they want a very simple approach that they can uh, implement in their training. Not a lot of equipment, not a lot of space, not a lot of sophistication. And then I think a third element is just looking at how it fits around uh, jujitsu. You know, I tell people that I realized that I was no longer a meathead. I was a jujitsu practitioner because when I started out, I was like, well, I can't roll now because it's going to interrupt with the weights. But now that I'm seven years in, I think, well, you know, I can't lift now because it's going to interrupt with the jujitsu. Yeah. You have to put yourself in the shoes of a, you know, no athlete loves to lift as much as coaches do. Put yourself in their shoes. So those were the three things that I went for. And then maybe kind of like a, a fourth, if you're a competitive athlete, people hate to gas out. So those were the, the kind of four things in that order that I targeted. That's kind of like the, the what, the program. That's, that's how we solve the problem. Once you've done that, if you reverse engineer a business, you say, all right, the lifetime revenue of a business is a function of how many people do you do business with multiplied by what's the total amount of money that you do business with, with each person. It's your LTV lifetime value multiplied by your number of customers. Okay. LTV is a function of the value that you create. The more value you create, the more you get to capture and get paid. Okay. There's a level two to this, which is coming, which is going to be the subscription, the ongoing business, mm -hmm. but that's not currently built. Okay. So what's, the predictor or the, the determinant of the number of customers that we do business with. It's two things. One is how many people do we reach in total distribution multiplied by the percentage that we can convert those people into customers, our conversion rate. So you want to push up both numbers as high as possible. How do you increase conversion rate? You be as persuasive as possible. You position yourself as an authority. You're trustworthy. You're likable. You show a track record of success. And you have to have a clear, concise, persuasive message. So that's basically within Train Heroic, it's a sales page. Yeah. You have to think about the structure. You have to think about what you say. You have to think about how you persuade people. Then once you have that in place, distribution. And if you look at the, the relative weighting of the two, it's probably distribution that matters the most. You know, Kylie Jenner is not the most persuasive or intelligent business person in the world. She's got a billion people that she can go out and reach and convert those into, into dollars. If you know the highest your conversion rate is ever going to be is a hundred percent. And that's probably not going to happen, but you can go out and be a thousand times bigger, 10,000 times bigger, a hundred thousand times bigger in the people that you reach. So 
you do want to increase conversion, but you also want to get distribution. Now, once you've said, right, let's go get distribution, to use the analogy from Safari, if I asked you to go out and get me a photograph of a hippo, are you going to look on the plains or up a tree? No. That's where you're going to find a lion and a leopard. If I said, get me a, a photo of a hippo, you're going to go to the watering hole. What's the equivalent for your niche or audience that you're serving? There are concentric circles to this. The best people to sell to is your existing customers. The next one is going to be your previous customers. If you don't have those two, you want to look for first degree connections. That's people that you know that are already pre-sold on you as a person rather than the product or service, but it still has the same effect. Then it is going to be friends of friends. Then it's probably going to be friends of friends of friends. Then it's probably going to be strangers. The first three layers is basically asking for introductions, sharing content, getting friends, to tag people, all that kind of stuff. Once you start to get out to strangers, you have to look at where these people are hanging out on the internet. So uh, hashtags, topics on uh, X, Reddit groups, YouTube channels, all these different things. Put yourself in the shoes of, of those people and ask, where do I go to talk about this stuff? And that is when you have to start being useful. It kind of ties in with this, but the further out of those concentric circles, the people lie, the less salesy you can afford to be the more educational and servant-like you have to be. If I've already sold you $2,000 worth of stuff, how, how much persuasion do you think I need to say, hey, do you want to buy this other thing for 100 bucks? Not much. If I've never met you before and I say, hey, do you want to buy this template for 100 bucks? They'd probably say that to you because no is the easiest word to say. So you have to be a lot more soft with your approach and then gradually advance them in to that red hot center of being somebody that's like a, a raving fan of yours. And that's basically the modules that we work through once the product has been built. Yeah, beautiful. How long of a program was the, the Jiu Jitsu program and what'd you sell it for? Eight weeks, 50 bucks. Beautiful, yeah. cool. So tell me, you know, just digging into to money moves a, a bit, you know, I might be a, an established coach with my own brick and mortar. I might be a, you know, a big time influencer. I might be somebody that's just graduated, got a certification and, and I want to get into the world. Who's money moves for? I think it depends on the, the level of sophistication. I think if you already have an established business where, yeah, you're selling digital products and services, you, you know what you're doing, all that kind of stuff. I'd say, you know, it probably hold fire until level two, when we get into the subscription and the, the higher level stuff that I alluded to from the first money moves. So owning the real estate, automating everything, passing people through that funnel, uh, really pushing your foot to the floor with, with uh, paid growth strategies and so on. I think that is level two stuff. Level one is maybe you've not worked for yourself before. Maybe you've not worked for yourself specifically within digital products and services. Um, you, you don't need a huge amount of income. You just need a little bit to kind of make that difference and, and to get some momentum. And, and learn the ropes as you go. That would be uh, ideal for those people, in my opinion. And that is actually the majority of coaches. Awesome. Awesome. And then what, what's included? So if, if I sign up, what should I, what should I expect? There's, we talked about eight weeks, yeah. uh, the eight-week module. Yeah. Anything else that you want to yeah, touch so on? So you sign up, eight weekly modules. With that comes a video walkthrough of me doing the, the worksheet to show how it's um, done and uh, how you apply it plus a walkthrough where applicable within Train Heroic, real like paint by numbers, right? Do this, do this, do this. Here's how it's built. Uh, then we have a Discord uh, channel for everyone within the community and anyone who signs up for the course gets lifetime access to the Discord. It's normally 490 bucks a year, but you know, as long as you're um, a student of the course, you get the Discord for, for life and I man that thing 24 seven. If you have a question, if you need help, you reach out to me, you reach out to anyone else in the channel and uh, yeah, we'll get you over the line. Beautiful, beautiful. Kier, what what I've loved working work what I've loved about working with you and uh and just seeing what what you've been able to put together is you've been there and you've done that. And I think coming from somebody that has uh I can't remember the exact line, but you're like uh, you know, but uh, I don't know, innovation's like made through necessity or whatever. I was in poverty well, and I had poverty is the mother of invention. <laughs> poverty is the mo mother of invention of invention. And and I think like for the coaches that that I'm working with, um <clears throat> They aspire to have the sophistication, have the systems, have the uh, even like the you know intellectual understanding, 
of business that you've taught yourself how to do. And I've just like, I'm so excited for the, just the opportunity for them to get in front of you and to get more people in front of you. Because, uh, oftentimes this is the missing skill to truly make an impact or create that freedom and flexibility that, that our coaches are longing for. Um, importantly, how do people sign up? Where do I go to, to sign up for money moves and when does the next class kick off? So we're going to launch again on January the 8th and you can go to call me here. K E I R dot com slash heroic. Okay. Call me Kier.com slash heroic. Yep. And Please. people will get the opportunity to sign up for a presentation where I, I give the long version of basically what we've just talked about. It's a hundred minute presentation where I tell okay. you exactly how I grossed, you know, a million bucks in, in revenue while working full time as a strength coach, 2008 to the present day. And then if they are sufficiently persuaded by that presentation, they'll have the opportunity to sign up for the course uh, off the back of that. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Kira. I appreciate your, appreciate your time. I'm excited to, to get this message out to the, to the world. Appreciate you having me, man. Thank you. Yeah.